Good morning. Hey guys, it's Carissa with the Praying Warriors Tribe. Um, I am here. It has been a little while since I did the last video and I apologize. Um, I've been going through some things and unfortunately a lot of it has felt more of just like attacks, spiritual attacks on me and it has sort of stalled me because of it and I'm I'm pushing through. The Lord is is pressing on me to keep going and to push through and and regardless of what the enemy is wanting, I am I'm just going to keep pushing through. So, we are on day 5 of Steadfast Love by Lauren Chandler, a study of Psalms 107. Just to recap the verses that we have been studying. This is still week one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I, I There's just been a lot going on. And, and unfortunately, this is the part of, of things that have suffered the most is are these videos. So um, Psalms 107, um, verses 1 through 3. I'm reading from the Passion Translation. I love this translation. If you guys can get a hold of this translation, I promise you when you read it in accordance with, you know, all these other translations, you will see and have just this deeper understanding of God's love. It's like God speaks his love through this translation. It is so beautiful. So Psalms 107 verses 1 through 3. Let everyone give all their praise and thanks to the Lord. Here's why. He's better than anyone could ever imagine. Yes, he's always loving and kind, and his faithful love never ends. So go ahead. Let everyone know it. Tell the world how he broke through and delivered you from the power of darkness and has gathered us together from all over the world. He has set us free to be his very own. So on day two, we discussed our brokenness as human beings, our broken worship, our innate tendency to cling to and confide in false anchors. We can be our own worst enemy. We can lie to ourselves. We can heap shame upon ourselves. I am extremely guilty of that. Uh, even with these videos, I was shaming myself because I didn't get to it. Um, without Jesus, we are a hazard to ourselves, but we're not our only enemy. In Psalms 107 verses 1 through 3, it states in there that uh, this is the CSB version, and I'll read it from this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the power of the foe and has gathered them from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. So we have a somewhat daunting task today. We're going to try to tackle the very real topic of Satan, the enemy or foe of our souls. Some of us are strangely fascinated with the supernatural, while others wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. There can be error in both. We can make too much of Satan and demons, giving them more credit than they're due, or we can deny their existence altogether. It, choosing to ignore a large chunk of scripture. And my aim is to offer you a balanced biblical view of the power of the foe. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to admit that in my raising and throughout my whole life, um, I did not give enough thought to the spiritual enemy. And I say the spiritual enemy instead of Satan because there's more than just Satan, okay? There's all of those fallen angels, you know, how he took a third out of heaven with him. All of those fallen angels, then we've got all the demonic spirits, all of the, um, just 
there's more than just Satan. And I never really thought about that until this year when my eyes were opened up to that. Um, you know, God has really called me into uh, being a warrior, a, a spiritual warfare warrior. And I, I didn't just stumble into it. I unfortunately got thrown into it in some of the worst ways ever. Um, you know, and, and I had to learn a whole lot, a whole lot on the go with it. Um, you know, and I've learned some really, really, really powerful tactics to go against the enemy. And one of them, which is sort of how, you know, the past week, week and a half has been for me is I sort of separate myself from the world and focus, just hone in on God and keep my focus, keep my eyes on him because um, one thing that, that the enemy tries to do for me, to me personally, is try and cause so much chaos around me that I don't know which way to look. And then the chaos builds up inside of me and I really stress and I really worry and I have a lot of fear and anxiety and it takes my focus off of Jesus where, you know, that's where my focus needs to be because guess what? I can't really, truly battle all of this on my own. I can only do it in Christ. That's where my victory comes from. And so I can't focus on all of this stuff that's happening around me. All of these punches that are being thrown straight at my face from all different directions. I have to keep my blinders on and sometimes... Sometimes it is just best to just keep those blinders on regarding the whole world around you. Like I even, I even backed away from posting on my Facebook page very much. Um, like all I wanted to do was just focus on Jesus this time. And it was a different tactic this, this go round because, uh, you know, my finances were hit. My hours at my job were hit. Um, a homeschooling snafu came up and I had to, I mean, it was manageable, but oh my stars, like it's something that I could have really gotten in trouble with because no fault through my own, the enemy was just attacking by not making sure that my stuff that I had sent months ago was properly handled. And it was just one hit after another, after another, after another, within a span of 24 hours. And <laughs> I'm just like, um, <laughs> this is not okay. Like, and, but instead of allowing that, that anxiety and that stress and that worry and that fear to rise up and choke me, I just stayed focused on Jesus and I praised him through everything. And, and I'm still going through it. I'm still in the midst of it. You know, not everything is resolved. I mean, I still don't have the hours that I need. I don't know how provisions are going to come in. And, um, you know, and I'm just like, okay, Lord, but I know you've got it. I know you've got it and I'm not going to worry about it. But, you know, through this year, my eyes have been greatly opened to spiritual warfare and the significance of it. And the fact that, especially in 2020, y'all, we're dealing with a whole lot of it. I really, really, really hope that your eyes are open to, you know, even just what's happening within our nation. It's just a huge, huge spiritual battle, huge spiritual battle. And we need to be fighting it with Jesus in him because it's in him is where we have our victory. Okay, so the enemy outside. We are going to read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. I'm reading from the Amplified Version, and it says, Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit, than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, 
We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God said, You shall not eat from it, nor touch it, otherwise you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. That is, you will have greater awareness, and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to look at, and a, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful, she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of the two of them were opened, that is, their awareness increased, and they knew that they were naked, and they fastened fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool afternoon breeze of the day. So man and his wife hid and kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled and deceived me, and I ate from the forbidden tree. So focusing on verse 1, what do we know about the serpent from this verse? Well, in verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit, than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. Okay, so he was crafty. The serpent was more crafty than any other thing. Okay. So then let's take a look at the dialogue between the serpent and the Eve. In Genesis 3, 1, excuse me, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, in Genesis 3, 1, it says, that's where it references, sorry. Can it be that God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? What did God actually say? So, in Genesis 2, verse 16 through 17, let's read that, okay? It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge, recognition of good and evil, you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day that you eat from it, you shall most certainly die because of your disobedience. Okay, so... God said, you can eat of any tree except for this one, okay? What did Eve say that God said? This is where it kind of gets a little tricky. This is where Satan subtly and craftily snatched, snatched at her, okay? So was she correct? She said that, let's just read it, okay? She said that God said, you shall not eat from it nor touch it. Otherwise, you will die. Okay, so no, God didn't say touch. He just said eat. In chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, he just said do not eat from it. Whereas Eve threw in the word, the words, nor touch it. And what was the consequence for eating of the tree? Death. So how did the serpent respond? But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's from Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. So how do you think Eve felt about God after hearing this? How would you have felt? And I put, I wrote down, my own thoughts on this was that God was holding something good back. That God wanted to control and be the only one with any knowledge. Question, why does he want ultimate control and knowledge? That would be, you know, those are the things that went through my mind. However, 
We don't know the conversations. I really wish that we did know the conversations between God and Adam and Eve because he visited them daily. He walked with them daily. He would have had some really, really insightful conversations full of knowledge. Okay, so it's not that he's holding back knowledge. He's just holding back death. So is the serpent right? And I said no, because we don't know good and evil to the extent of God. We still, even eating it, we still don't know the extent of good and evil. Or even to the extent that Satan knows it, okay? So that just opened up our eyes to the realization of it all and... You know, look at what we're dealing with today. The evils of this world, you know, good is being called evil and evil is being called good. We're living in that time. And unfortunately, you know, that's that's the product of sin right there. And and I don't know about you, but I don't want to be living in that. (laughs) So God was truly, you know, I, I I, I feel like God was truly protecting us from that end of things. So how did Adam and Eve respond to having their eyes opened? Well, for one, they tried to hide. They became aware of their nakedness or shame. They felt shame. And did the serpent make Adam and Eve take the fruit? No. No, they, you know, this this is where free will comes in. And we are tested. We are tested with our own free will. Um... You know, even with with what I've been going through the past couple of weeks, it's been a test for me, for me to choose how I'm going to respond in those moments, for me to choose, especially in a, in a particular situation that it involved someone else that, you know, I don't necessarily consider uh, a buddy of mine, but I have to live with the consequences of dealing with them in my life because... <laughs> We have children together. So, I mean, I could have chosen in the in the heat of a particular moment to to lose it. And, you know, I chose instead to turn and go to God and say, I know you've got it. I know you've got it. I don't know what your plan is. I don't I may not fully understand what's happening in this moment, but I know you've got it and I know you've got me. And I had to, you know, just not respond and react in my fleshy nature. So we are constantly being tested of our free will and and what we choose to do. Okay, so list the three things that Eve noticed about the fruit in verse six. The tree was good for food. It was delightful to look at. And it was a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful. So we're going to we're going to hone in on that third one there for a moment, okay? We're going to turn to James chapter 1 verse 14. And when I was doing this particular study, uh, a revelation came to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me because you know, I'm I'm having to deal with I get some shame and condemnation from myself regarding um, something that had happened, you know, in the past, probably about a year ago now. And it stems from desire. So I'm going to read James chapter one, verse 14. And it says, instead, it is each person's own desires and thoughts that drag them into evil and lure them away into darkness. Verse 15, evil desires give birth to evil actions, and when sin is fully mature, it can murder you. Verse 16, so my friends, don't be fooled by your own desires. We have to really keep our desires in check, okay? So what's interesting is that Eve's desires alone weren't evil. How she looked to fulfill those desires was evil, God gave Adam and Eve everything they needed and more in the garden. So we're going to read Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, and complete the following. I've already filled filled it all in. 
And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what about obtaining wisdom, you ask? How did God provide that in the garden? Well, God is wisdom. What he told them about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was wisdom. Don't eat it or you'll die. Would it have been wise for them to have obeyed and avoided it? Yes. We wouldn't be here in this whole mess that we are living, especially here in 2020, if they had. But what about death? Did God get his bluff in? And I've already sort of read some of this. And James 1.15 goes on to say, Then desires when it has conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. Eve looked for her desires to be fulfilled in the wrong thing, which birthed disobedience, taking the fruit and eating it. For a moment, it seems the serpent was right. They didn't die immediately. But the life they knew came to an immediate end. They no longer enjoyed fellowship with God and with each other. For the first time ever, they knew shame and hid from God. They lied and played the blame game. The gates of Eden were closed to them, the tree of life guarded by a flaming sword. The countdown to physical death started with the first bite of the forbidden fruit. The serpent used his wiles to accomplish his will for Adam and Eve. Believe me, he is a will for your life too. He is a thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. John chapter 10, 10. He is our adversary who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. To devour. 1 Peter 5, 8, but praise God, we are not ignorant of his designs. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Satan doesn't have a new bag of tricks. He uses the same old designs or schemes. So let's take a peek into his bag. There are five, five different tricks that he has, okay? Number one, he pretends to be your friend. He said to the woman, okay? Number two, he prompts you to question what God says and who he is. Did God actually say? Number three, he appeals to our desires. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. Number four, he provokes you to take matters into your own hands. She took of its fruit and ate. Number five, his path leads to death. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out. Is there an area of your life where you feel you're somewhat stuck in this bag of tricks? I want you to really think about it. He, I want you to really think about it. Okay, is there any part of what I just listed one through five that resonate you with you? I know that I have two that. I have been prompted to question what God says and who he is. It's the whole reason why I'm actually doing this study is because I have aligned myself with a particular lie and I am, I am standing in God's truth to write that and to, to learn really and truly who God is in this season for me. And he, he has appealed to my own desires and you know, that one's a really hard one. That one's, that one was a really hard one to swallow when, when I learned about it, but I loved learning about it. I loved having that revelation from the Holy Spirit because it opened up my eyes and it made me aware of how I walked off the path that God had me on. So that way I can keep myself in check in the future and, and realize something before it happens. That's the important thing. And with that revelation, there came no shame from the Holy Spirit. It was all in love. That correction and that revelation was all in love to prevent me from shaming myself any further and to prevent me from potentially going down that path again. So that, that way I was just made aware of it, that that's where I had messed up. That is where I had messed up. So, you know, I can now moving forward, I can now really check myself. So think about, think about those things. How is the devil tricking you and snagging you? Okay. What lies 
about God have you been led to believe? What are those lies about God that you have aligned yourself with that you need to relearn his truth? Okay. For me, it was, does he really have you? And does he really love you? And, and already, you know, like I've said in this most recent, you know, attack that's especially been on my finances, I have kept standing on the truth of, I know that you love me. I know that you care. I know that you have me. And he has, thankfully, he has been so loving and kind to reassure me of those things when I've asked for that reassurance. So that way I can continue to stand on that truth. Okay, moving on. The ancient serpent, the accuser, and Job. Now, I love the story of Job. Love, love, love the story of Job. You may be asking, what does the serpent have to do with Satan? He's not called Satan here. Revelation 20 verse 2 makes the connection. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Pretty direct statement. He is, this, he is the deceiver, accuser, tempter, and enemy of our souls. Unlike 99% of Hollywood's interpretation of him, he is not on equal footing with God. He is created. God is uncreated. No one made God. Now, that can open up a whole litany of questions. Why would God make Satan? Why would he allow evil? There's always an element of mystery with the Lord. As much as he has revealed about himself in scripture, our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. Isaiah 55, 8. What we can do is look at another interaction between God, Satan, and a human. Job was an outstanding man. Job 1.1 1, 1 says that man was blameless and upright who feared God and turned away from evil. He fathered seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and many servants. He was the greatest of all the people of the East, Job 1.3. Needless to say, he was a man surely blessed. So we're going to read Job chapter 1, verse 6 through 22. If I can find it. Here we go. Okay. Verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan, the adversary accuser, also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Then Satan answered the Lord, from roaming around on the earth and from walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered and reflected on my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God with reverence and abstains from and turns away from evil because he honors God. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge of protection around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Put, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that, that Job has is in your power. Only do not put your hand on the man himself. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine on their, in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the, docks, donkey, the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians attacked and swooped down on them and took away the animals. They also killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger also came and said, The fire of God, lightning, has fallen from the heavens and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and have taken them away and have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. 
While he was still speaking, another messenger also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the desert and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head in mourning for the children and fell to the ground and worshiped God. He said, naked, without possessions, I came into this world from my mother's womb and naked, I will return to return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Wow. Okay. So who mentioned Job first? God mentioned Job, Job to 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 Satan first. How does Satan respond to God's statement about Job? What is his accusation against Job? That it, it is because of God's protection and blessings that Job loves and fears the Lord. So how does God respond? God gave Satan the power. He removed his divine protection. Satan had to ask permission to sift Job. That's part terrifying and part comforting. Terrifying that the Lord would allow something hard into my life, yet comforting to know Satan isn't running unchecked. John Piper aptly calls him a lion on a leash. The Lord tells Satan how far he can go and he can go no further. Fast forward to the end of the book of Job, chapter 42, verses 10 through 17. I'm trying to get through this because I have about five minutes left that I can record. Um, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before came to him and they ate bread with him in his house and they consoled him and comforted him over all the distressing adversaries that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave a piece of money and each a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jem Jemima, and the first name of the second Kazaya, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. And in all the land, there were found no women so fair as the daughters of Job and their fathers gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons, four generations. So Job died an old man and full of days. So how does it end for Job? God restored everything back twice as much. Satan didn't know what the end would hold, but God did. Job didn't know how it would all turn out, but God did. There's a song we sing in our church with a bridge that remind us, even when the enemy, even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. We may not be at the place where we can see the good. We might be smack dab in the middle of the hard. Hello. But we can remember that Satan is merely a pawn in God's hand. Not only that, but Satan has been checkmated. He may still have moves to make on the board, but Colossians 2 verse 15 tells us that he has been ultimately